morning, church. Listening to the choir this morning. These little opening songs, right? These songs that we sing just as we're getting ourselves settled. It's the oldest form of prayer. We've been doing this a long time. Because in song, we can voice things that we can't always voice just in speech or even in our own heads. But we sing and the words flow. Not just poetry, but praise. And everything else. It's a good way to start. It's one of the gifts of this congregation is our music ministry. Amen. I can't tell you how many churches I know right now who are desperate to find a musician. Right? And we have a whole loft. <laughs> Summer projects, one of the things I'm working on is um, looking at all of the African American ELCA congregations. The researcher in me is tough to quiet down sometimes. And the thing that I'm discovering is that how healthy Genesis is right now, comparatively. And it's not just the black churches in the ELCA either. We have gifts, gifts to share with our community, with our families. There are a whole lot of people out there looking for something, and they may not even know what that is. They are not gonna just happen to stumble past our door and fall in. Hey, here I am. <laughs> it's not the way it works. We gotta go tell them. We gotta go invite them in. We have to let them know that we can be a place for them, grounded in Jesus and all of his teachings. Just something to think about. We have gifts to share in this congregation and we have been blessed. I've got a couple of announcements this morning. Um, as you can see, um, for fellowship today, we're gonna be having our shoebox lunches. Very excited about this. It's always dangerous though when the food starts being made during church. <laughs> because that's what people are thinking about all of a sudden. <laughs> well, see, yeah, I mean, it's like, Pastor, it doesn't matter what you say, just make it quick. <laughs> you can keep praying for that, it may not happen. <laughs> But it's an awesome thing, so please stay for fellowship today. Um, if you are in the Metro Detroit area and you haven't made the decision to come to church today yet, right, know that this is a good day to come. Um, good opportunity for fellowship to be able to be fed at the table and to be fed at the tables. And this is a good thing. Speaking of good things, um, don't forget, next week, weather permitting, we will have outdoor worship and our annual church picnic. Um, yes, I have already have plans in store for the bees. <laughs> I'm just telling you, not this year, little flying insects, I'm just saying. Um, but one of the things I did read, and so if anybody who is who's working on the picnic, you wanna think about this, um, a natural way to do it is you cut lemons in half and you stick um, 
cloves, whole cloves, either the lemon, they don't like either one of them, the combination makes them decide to go someplace else. We have other, other issues, as, we have other um, <laughs> remedies as well, but we'll go the all natural um, in the tent. I'm just, don't let that, don't let the bees be the thing that say, oh, I guess I'm not gonna go. Please don't do that. You can always come in inside and eat. I'm just saying. We'd love to have you here. We'd love to be a part um, together as family for um, outdoor worship. And of course, don't forget then, on Saturday of this week is Makalai. Um, celebration of all of the people in our neighborhood and the businesses and the churches up and down Mac Avenue. Um, parade, I think, starts at 10 o'clock and then all the festivities will be down here at the here on the Genesis Lutheran Church grounds immediately following. So come out to uh, be a part of our community. Another opportunity to be a part of our community is this Wednesday at six o'clock, um, from six to eight o'clock is the Genesis Hope Community Meeting. Um, this is a great opportunity for us as a congregation to actually get to know our neighbors. We say that we stayed here for the neighborhood. Well, let's come out and be with our neighbors. <laughs> um, I, these are great meetings. It's an opportunity to hear what's going on in the city of Detroit, the um, various um, groups that are doing things, the services that are provided for the Island View neighborhood and greater Detroit. This is a great opportunity, so come out. Wednesday, six o'clock, they always serve dinner. Um, and see, and now you're thinking that, Pastor, you're just enticing us with food for everything on your list. If it works, <laughs> I'm not so proud, right? You know, I'm, that's just the way that is. Um, last two announcements. Um, don't forget, for those of you who join us online, um, we are switching our live streaming to our YouTube channel starting September 10th. Um, I've seen a lot of people subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you for doing that. Um, when you subscribe, I also hope you also, um, there's a little bell icon right next to it. If you click that bell, if you ring the bell, you will get um, notifications in your email um, that a live thing is happening. So um, I would encourage you all to do that. It's a great opportunity, um, which makes me think of one more thing that needs to happen. Um, Roland, I'm looking at you because you and I are the ones who usually do this, but if you and the men of Genesis want to change the sign out front, um, we got to take down the Facebook Live thing because that's soon to be old news. Um, and so we'll change the sign and let people know in the community as well. All right, that's more than enough, Dr. Grant. Um, <laughs> I, I, can, I can hear my daughter right now going, Dad. <laughs> just move on <laughs> yeah to <laughs> see they're rushing me off the stage already um all right um if there are no other announcements i don't think sorry did you have anything Eastside Community Center, Community Network, Eastside Community Network. Okay, we will keep them in our prayers, but we will also be aware of the fact that um, this is what we're fighting for, right? Yeah, sorry if you would go ahead and raise. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Serena. We will definitely keep them in our prayers. But again, you know, this is this is why this is important, right? The work that we do is to move towards days when that does not happen. Um, and so, let us keep all of that in our prayers and in the way we think about our vision and mission for our congregation. 
So thank you, Sarita. All right, if those are all the announcements, I think, um, and thank you for that, um, let's go ahead and stand, and you'll find the confession and forgiveness in your bulletins. The congregation responds with the bold print. Um, and let us begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Trusting in God whose promise is sure, and grace never fails, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and our neighbors. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you. We have hurt our community. We have squandered your blessings. We have hoarded your bounty. We have failed to be honest. We have lacked the courage to speak. We have spoken falsely. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. God offers boundless grace when we fail. By God's gift of mercy, you are freed and forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Having been reconciled to God, let us now be reconciled to one another. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Also with you. Let us share a sign of God's peace with one another.
Let us pray. O oh God, source of our salvation, open our ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. The Word is among us. The Spirit is present. May the Lord add a blessing to these readings. Amen. Amen. Good morning. morning. First lesson comes from Isaiah chapter 56, verse 1, and then verses 6 through 8. Amen. Thus says the Lord. Maintain justice and do what is right. For soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. On verse 6. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. Okay, the psalm for today is Psalm 67. Please read with me responsibly. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the people with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its May God continue to bless us and let all the ends of the earth revere him. The second, uh, lesson, second reading for today is Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 2a, and then 29 through 32. Then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. May God add a blessing to the readings today. Amen. Amen.
Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter, verses 21 through 28. Amen. Matthew writes, Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the gospel of our Lord.
one of us has a story to tell about that love and how it works in our lives and through us. And thinking of the gospel today, which is a hard text to hear. And thinking of the Canaanite woman. All I could think about was a young man that I met a number of years ago. This was during the early 2000s when we lived down on the U.S.-Mexico border. And it was during the time when there was a lot of ginned up panic about people crossing over the U.S.-Mexico border. And our church in Texas, well, we were used to folks coming through. We were only 15 miles from the border. And when Sunday morning, as Denise and I were making our way from the office past the fellowship hall over to the church, we noticed that there was a makeshift bed constructed out of cardboard and other items tucked underneath the walkway, the covered walkway by the fellowship hall. This was not an uncommon occurrence. And it wasn't long before we found out who it was that had made a makeshift home. He'd gotten across the border with the help of a coyote. Those people who charge exorbitant fees to get you across the border and to take you where you want to go. But the moment he got across the river, the coyote abandoned him. And he was scared, alone, stuck. Because in deep south Texas, there's only one road that really goes north and south. Highway 281. And about 40 miles in from the border, there's a massive checkpoint that everybody has to stop at. Everybody. Massive checkpoint, they search for illegals, as they call them. Illegal drugs or illegal people. That's what they said. Now, the Supreme Court has assured us that this is not a violation of everybody's Fourth Amendment rights against unlawful searches and seizures. I don't buy it. <laughs> Never have. Right? Everybody, is there a probable cause to stop every car that leaves the valley? Denise always kept me from putting a little sign up in our windshield that says, my Fourth Amendment rights being trampled right now. <laughs> she said, please, don't. We're trying to get someplace. <laughs> and of course, it's a bigoted policy, isn't it? I mean, you think about it. Do we have similar checkpoints 40 miles from the Canadian border? No, we do not. And during that time, this was the early 2000s, people were like, well, you know, Pastor, in that time it was Dr. Grant. There's a reason for that. And I said, really? Because the people who bombed the World, or the World Trade Center came from Canada. It's just a little detail, right? Anyway, it would have been an easy thing to do what I'm sure many or too many in the United States would have thought was the right thing to do. Turn him in. But then again, the disciples thought the right thing to do was to send the Canaanite woman away. So let's be clear about who he was. People would say, and this is the word that they used, the phrase that they would use, that he was an illegal alien. And I just want to tell you that that phrase is as vile and hateful and hurtful as any you could possibly imagine. And I know that this congregation can imagine too many. And we don't even have to imagine. 
Now, the congregation, Denise's congregation at the time, had DEA agents in it. We had border patrol agents in it, right? It would have been easy to turn this guy in. That's what everybody would scream. He's just one of those people. Focusing on the those and not so much on the people. Because that's who he was. A person that needed to be seen for the troubles that his life had become. So instead of turning him in, and I'm telling you, this is a congregational conversation where I'm like, no, we're not turning him in. Nobody. Even the Border Patrol agents were like, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> we gave him refuge in the storage set that we used for our food pantry. It was climate controlled. Got him a mattress, a burner phone, a <laughs> little bit of money. Oh no, we were, new, we were smart enough not to get him an actual phone. Plenty of food. And he asked if there was something else, anything else that we could do. He said that he was gonna try to get in touch with family that had made it to California. But we weren't sure how he was gonna do that. He couldn't go north, not with a checkpoint. He can't go back across the border, that was the problem. <laughs> and a few days later, he was gone. We never found out what happened. We just hoped and prayed that he would be okay. That we had given him a chance. That we as a congregation had grown maybe just a little. It's all he wanted. He just wanted a chance to live, a chance to break the cycle of mistrust and violence and hatred and economic hardship that drove him to undertake this desperate journey. Nobody decides that they wake up one morning and say, you know what, I'm gonna risk everything and cross the border. Nobody wakes up and says, I wanna invite that kind of trouble in my life. They go because they don't have another choice. They're desperate. And they're hoping that somebody sees them as a person who is in need. That same desperation drove the Canaanite woman to approach Jesus. Her daughter needed to be healed. The desire consumed her, and of course it did. It would consume any of us. If one of our children was sick and we knew that there was somebody that could help, of course we would go to that person. We would give anything, do anything to make it better. So she approached the one that she had heard about that could do something about it. Of course you would go. Who wouldn't? She cried for mercy. She called Jesus Lord, Son of David, and those aren't random titles. She heard those from somebody. She wasn't an Israelite. She was from the border. She was on the coast. She was those people. And she uses the words that she knows is gonna get somebody's attention. And Jesus, said nothing. Jesus gave her the silent treatment. And I want that to sink in. I want you to feel how shocking that is. Because it is. And the whole rest of this text just gets worse. Because the disciples, oh, they're a big help. They just want her gone. Why? She's loud. Right? And I've always thought about this. I've always thought about that part of it. When I've heard people say, we're warm and welcoming, except they don't want kids in church because kids are loud. <laughs> you know what kids do? They're loud sometimes. You know what adults do sometimes? They're loud too. <laughs> and you always want to say, 
We want to grow. We want young families. But don't, no, those kids better not make a move or make a sound. And you're thinking, you know those are two different things, right? <laughs> Jesus has been teaching the disciples about how to lift up and feed and care for. They just finished feeding the 5,000. They just finished healing everybody in across the Sea of Galilee. It's not like he's been hiding this from them, and they're like, send her away. She's too loud. Oh, I'm sorry if she offends your delicate sensibilities. <laughs> She's got a problem that she would like solved. And Jesus doesn't help at all, turns around and says to the disciples, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Oh, thanks, Rabbi. So glad you stopped by. But still, she persisted. She dropped to her knee before this guy who just essentially gave her the cold shoulder and she begged him, Lord, help me. And then I don't know about you, but the next part is when the bottom just falls right out. Because Jesus looks at her square in the eye and says, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. I'm sorry, there's no way to make that sound good. <laughs> there isn't. That response is so repellent, so dismissive, that preachers have been trying to make Jesus' harsh words say something, anything else, ever since he slept them slip through his teeth. I mean, folks have tried to bend themselves into pretzel shapes, trying to excuse Jesus. Oh, I'm sorry, he didn't really say that. Oh, no, I heard him. Those words, they're written down. You can't get away from that. You can't get away from the fact that what Jesus just said was cruelly exclusive. He compared her to a dog. And I'm sorry, in Israel, they didn't have pet dogs. They didn't. You know why? Because they thought they were just scroungers, scavengers, right? That was the worst insult that you could use. It's like looking at somebody crossing the border and saying, illegal alien. Or other words that I will not use. It is the same level. And we're trying to find a way that this is just a way for Jesus to do something different than what he just said. Theologians and preachers have said, oh, no, no, Jesus didn't really mean it. He was just testing her to see how great her faith was. And all I can so say to that is, that doesn't make it any better. <laughs> right? It, it, Jesus is going to put us through these vituperative insults just to see if our faith is strong enough? Oh, I have a response, <laughs> which I can't say in church either. What? This is, it's like the replaying of the whole Job thing. Let's see how faithful Job really is. Let's wipe out him and kill all his family. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea, God. Good plan. Who needs that? I'm sorry. And I know this may sound really weird and really strange and kind of harsh, but I don't need that. And if that's what the church is teaching, I'm out of here. It's galling to me that any preacher has ever decided to do that. Oh, no, I'm just testing you. Oh, test this. <laughs> right? But folks have done this. I mean, it's no wonder people leave the church. Right? We're going to hold you up to the highest standard, but we're going to sneak under the door frame in response. I always love those people who are like holier than now, and then you know that they're going to get caught stealing money from the church till at best. But folks have done this, right? They twisted themselves into these pretzel shapes because they are desperate, desperate to avoid the most 
obvious point that not only was Jesus fully divine, but Jesus was also fully human which meant that Jesus was going to do things that are fully human. And that humanity is what we're running away from because it unnerves us. It's too close to home, and we don't want to think that Jesus makes mistakes or says things that we would say in response to somebody who is in need. We want Jesus not to be like us, at all. And in any stretch of the imagination, the divine Jesus, we love that. The human Jesus, oh no. <laughs> but here's the thing, if Jesus isn't fully human, he doesn't know what we need saving from. If Jesus has never walked in our shoes, he has no idea what we need, but he has, so that he can. And interestingly enough, as pastor and theologian, Will Gaffney points out, Jesus is not generically human, right? Jesus is a rabbi from the first century, which means that he carries those cultural and ethnic and religious contexts with him into every encounter he has. He's a good first century rabbi, right? He knows his Hebrew scriptures backward and forward. And he acts like somebody from the first century. And we see those full on display in this encounter. Jesus responds as the good rabbi that he is. Oh, no, no, no. This is only for the people of Israel. Declaring it was unfair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But then the thing happens that doesn't usually happen. When the authority usually crushes the one who is not in control, they usually just step back, defeated by a system that was militated to work against them. And she doesn't do that. She doesn't do that at all. She says, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. <laughs> and I want you to feel that. I want you to hear that as the challenge that it is. She is looking at Jesus square in the eye and saying, yep, fine, I'll take it. I'll take the crumbs, because that's going to be enough. Your crumbs are more than sufficient for me. And I don't care where you're coming from, but I know what's at stake. And then Jesus does the thing that blows our minds. And that makes a lot of people run, sprinting away from this text because they don't want to acknowledge what takes place. It's the hardest thing for us to do. But it is absolutely imperative if we want this world to get better. If we want to get better. If we want to make our neighborhoods better. If we want to do what we have been called to do, and that is Jesus, and this is going to be the thing that everybody's going to be like, oh no, Pastor, you've gone too far. <laughs> Jesus grew. Jesus changed. You see, most of us, most of the time, are going to let our personal prejudices our personal likes and dislikes rule our responses. You know what we're really good at? Not changing. <laughs> we remain unchanged, even by those who are in need. And here, Jesus grows. He shakes off the cultural and religious baggage, and he sees her in her need. 
and he acts on it. And when God and Jesus move, I want to tell you something, they always move to become more inclusive, more merciful, more peaceful, more loving. When God and Jesus move, they always move for the good of us and for the good of the creation that they have made. After the flood, what does God say? I will never destroy the people again. Not that he didn't feel like it every now and then. <laughs> right? Abraham bargains with God about how many good people need to be found in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to save the people, and God changes his mind more than once, right? Abraham bargains with him like he's at a stall in a marketplace someplace, right? I don't know, how about five? What about one? And God's like, uh, okay, yeah, they're done. Moses begged God not to destroy the people of Israel after they made the golden calf, and frankly, God had every right, right? They, he got them out of Egypt. He rescued them from slavery and bondage. He was taking them to the promised land, and they were like, yeah, you're not going fast enough. No, we don't like their food. Why, did you bring us out here to kill us? Fine, we're going to make our own God. And I'm sure if you were at that moment and you were God, you would be like, you're done. And instead, God does this, and the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. Changed his mind. God, much to Jonah's chagrin, changes his mind and decides not to destroy the people of Nineveh. And that irritated Jonah to no end. Jonah wanted Nineveh wiped off the map, and God's like, no, not going to do it. I had it all warmed up, right? He was in the bullpen. He got the pitch ready, and like, nah, it's fine. <laughs> every time, every time God and Jesus change and grow, they move in the direction of mercy, inclusion. It's the expansion of grace and peace and love. In Isaiah, after the exile, when the Israelites are desperately closing ranks, forcing out all foreigners and what, what they were doing, right? You all got to go. And there's the Lord saying, I declare that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Right? Everybody is welcome on my holy mountain. And the Israelites, you've got to imagine, they're going, well, who invited these people? And God's like, I did. You got something to say to that? God once sent prophets. He would send prophet after prophet after prophet to preach the word of the Lord. And when it no longer worked, when the people didn't seem to be listening anymore, he changed tack, and he sent his only son to be love incarnate. Jesus was sent not to condemn the world, but to save the world. And notice, the world, not just the Israelites, <laughs> not just a certain collective of people, it's all of us. That's what God intended. And so Jesus was moved by the woman's faith, her pleas, her need, her tenacity, and so moved, he expanded his mercy. He expanded his healing. He expanded his love. And people, we are made in the image of the God who grows. We are made in the image of the God who moves towards more mercy, greater peace unconditional love, which means that we can grow. We can change. We can extend our welcome. We can open our doors and grow beyond our prejudices, moving ever in the direction of greater mercy, inclusion of love. Because if we are not growing, we are dying. And we worship a living God. 
a God who is alive and who encourages us to live fully as we have been made. I mean, there's not a one of us that isn't here because God's grace grew. I mean, it's just like the Israelites of old. If God looks at us and was going to judge us based on what we actually did or didn't do, how many of us deserve to be here today? None of us, which means that God's grace grew to include even us, passed us through the waters of baptism, feeds us at his table, even though he knows that we have been sinful and unclean every single week, and still he says, come to the table. Come be fed so that you can go feed. We are one because Christ, our great example, the best of what a human being can be, lived, lived in love, grew in grace and power and strength. He lived in all the complexity that that means. And he has shown us that this is the only way forward. The only way forward. We were created in the image of the God who grows. So let us live as Christ lived. Let us see Canaanite women and men who have crossed the border not as statistics, but as people in need. Because each one of us was that person, is that person. Without grace, we ain't going to make it. And so let us live that grace. Let us grow. Let us see and work for and with every single person in need. And it may not be somebody who's hungry or who has crossed the border. Maybe it's just somebody who has had a week that they can't escape from. Or who once again has lived through bigotry and racism that we are definitely trying to stamp out. For the need is great. The one seeking a community, a family, seeking shelter or healing, refuge, sanctuary, seeking somebody to lean on or hope, somebody seeking inclusion, justice, welcome, peace. Let us ever live and grow in grace and mercy. It's who we were created to be. And Jesus, in his growth, has shown us the way. Amen.
please stand for the prayers. Confident that God receives our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, for those in need, and all of God's creation. O oh God, your spirit gathers the church. Shepherd those who are newly baptized and newly ordained in the proclamation of the gospel. Breathe life into ecumenical and interreligious endeavors. Support missionaries throughout the globe. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You call leaders to bridge differences and practice generosity. Inspire all in authority to protect people in harm's way. Deliver those in bondage. Support fair elections. Provide care for military personnel and veterans. And show mercy to those for whom they have responsibility. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You provide for those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Embrace people who have been rejected because of difference. Heal trauma caused by racism or prejudice. Shield any who are persecuted. Console the dying. Heal the sick, especially those we name silently or aloud. So pray for those enduring crippling heat throughout the world. And we pray especially for those who are in central Texas suffering a debilitating drought. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. O oh God, guide our leaders and ministers of this congregation in their visioning, planning, and living their faith out loud for the building up of our congregation and community. We pray especially for Sarita, Kim, Norma, Jackie, Terry, Roland, Janine, Tamika, Cindy, and Connie. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We give you thanks for those who now rest from their labors. In this day, we Continue our prayers for the family of Tony Pryor. Motivate us by their lives of dedication to the gospel until that day when we join with them in our eternal home. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Wise and gracious God, receive the labor of our hands, the gifts of money, bread, and wine, along with our offering of our lives. Nourish us with the life of your Son, that we might be his body in the world, making known your abundant mercy in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. And lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal. In the beginning, you formed the heavens and earth and created us in your likeness. You made us guardians of your good creation and left the earth in our care. All through our weary years and our silent tears, you did not abandon us to ourselves, but sought us out in love. When we were captives in Egypt, you did not abandon us. When we wandered in the wilderness, you did not abandon us. When we turned to false gods, you did not abandon us. Through your holy prophets, you called us to return to your graciousness, to your mercy, and to your steadfast love. In the crowning act of love, you gave your only son that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For you sent Jesus not to condemn the world, but to save the world from sin. Through his death on the cross, we who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. 
In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. With this bread and cup, we remember Christ's life among us, his association with outcasts, his eating with sinners, his healing of the sick, his care of the poor. Send, we pray, your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and wine that we who share this meal may become a holy communion, the body of Christ in the world. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Let us join together to pray the prayer that Christ himself has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come, for the table is set, and all are welcome.
join me in the post-communion prayer. Let us pray. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. And we pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.